Welcome to the block party. My name is Seth Kushner. Today I'm joined by one of my favorite people. And I don't know how much I say that before a podcast. I might be lying the other times I say that, but this is legit dinger. I've had him on pretty much any show I've ever been on. He's always been there for me. And because he was a member of the Carolina Hurricanes and the Tampa Bay Lightning, it makes sense that he's on the block party this week. Welcome, Dinger, live from your truck in Edmonton. <laughs> Thanks. It's an exciting place here in my truck. <laughs> Dinger, it's, I know you've been on like lockdown in Canada for the last, you know, two years or whatever it seems like. Uh, I mean, how crazy are you going at this point? I mean, I only know what's going on with Canadian politics through your tweets. And it's <laughs> like you're over it at this point. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's uh, it's been challenging, to say the least. <laughs> I always like the odd tweet where, you know, everyone jokes around about Florida. Like when I was doing my radio show. We did this segment where, like, it, did this happen in Florida or only in Florida? Like, weird news. And some of the weirdest things you think, you know, there's no way that happened. No, yeah, it happened in Florida. So he made a couple of tweets or just a couple of online things where they get Trudeau and the Canadian government in Alberta. Like, Florida's putting you to shame. Like, everyone makes fun of Florida. Like, it's just, you know, Wild Wild West or it's just, you know, Florida, right? Like, whatever. I'm like, Florida's putting everyone, Florida and Texas are putting Canada to shame with vaccinations and openings and, the way they've been doing things. So yeah, it's been a little, uh, it's been a little trying at times, but uh, it's been pretty good. Uh, I'm still happily married. And uh, so, yeah. Dude, listen, we're, va- we're <laughs> vaccinating people at the lightning games. Like when you come to a lightning game, we'll vaccinate you right there, like on Thunder Alley. So we're really trying to, you know, expedite the process and get everybody taken care of so we can continue to enjoy some of these playoff games. What's it like for you to see people back in the arena watching all these Stanley cup playoff games so far? Uh, I mean, it's great. I think it's, uh, I mean, what a difference. I mean, that's what the Stanley cup is all about. Like, the atmosphere in the, in the arenas and for the guys and the players. So, I mean, it's great to see, uh, I mean, I've spent a winter pretty much driving my kids to their sports and then sitting in the truck. So now that I'm in my truck again, I've spent a lot of time in here. Thank God the seat's comfortable <laughs> and I got air conditioned or heated seats. I got both. So Thank God for that, depending on the weather. But uh, yeah, it's great. I'm like watching this and I'm like, man, why did we move? <laughs> the way everything's played out with uh, COVID and everything. But we've got, like, our family's gotten vaccinated and stuff. My shoulder hurt for two days. So I, I'm okay. I'm still alive. So I, I was I was joking with my poor sense of humor. If someone was probably going to die from getting vaccinated, it'd probably be me. But uh, I'm okay. I just had a sore shoulder for two days. But it could have been for my kids punching me too, because I chirp them quite a bit and uh, tell them they're <clears throat> not very tough or they're soft. So they show me that they're not. And I'm not allowed to punch them back. So <laughs> it's kind of a one-sided fight. Every once in a while, I'll put them in a headlock or something. So <laughs> hey, I do think that's good news, though. You did get vaccinated. Nothing happened to you. So that's a message to anybody else that's on the fence about getting vaccinated. The same thing happened to me. I was prepared to die again. Like you said, I thought it was going to be the yeah. end of the world. But boom, got through the night, got through the next day. I was fine. Didn't even have a sore arm because I was doing the, uh, you know, you're supposed to move it around and all this stuff. Wasn't quite doing curls, but I was getting there. I was stretching it behind my head. So I felt good about that. But that's just what we're doing to try to get out there again with the people. Oh, yeah. Whatever it takes. And that's what I'm about. Uh, I'm a people person. I like hanging out with people. And, you know, it's obviously been difficult on everybody. and Everyone's had to adjust and teams and different things. And we've seen, you know, all the teams have gone through it. And, and you know, with the Vancouver Canucks, what they had to go through. And, uh, you know, it would have been a great story if they could have made it into the playoffs after, you know, everything had happened when they came back. And I think, what was it? They beat Toronto. I think it was two games in a row or something after being off for like a week. So, I mean, that was a pretty good story. And I was like, man, that'd be great if they could make it just, you know, just show what that's what sports to me are all about is perseverance. And, you know, not everyone has this like smooth sailing, especially in life. Like everyone goes through ups and downs and that's the beauty of sports is that, uh, you know, guys have injuries and and different things. And you look at even what happened last night with Toronto, Montreal. And, you know, I'm not a much, I'm not a Montreal fan. I'm not a Toronto hater, but uh, wow, what a great story. And we'll see the aftermath of that. And you get that young guy to know who, um, who, uh, sorry about that. Who, good. <laughs> I don't know, I cut my Zoom my meeting off. What happened there? Yeah, he, went missing. he went missing, he went blank. We can I don't know what happened there. You're back. There we go. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, <clears throat> I got a phone call there and apparently he shut my Zoom off. So, I mean, but what a, what a great story. So, uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about Toronto and Montreal, and I don't know why. Oh, yeah, so 
why, why do people hate Toronto so much? I mean, it's not like it, it's not like they have this all star team. There's a lot of you know people around the league that have teams that are up against the cap that have a lot of star players. What is it again? I don't. I I, I guess maybe I just haven't been involved in hockey that long. But it seems like they're hated. Like the Dallas Cowboys are hated. Like the New York Yankees are hated. And they're just they're they seem like they're they're in that genre. I think it's the media attention they get in Canada, and they get so much of it, and. You know, here in Edmonton, obviously, Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl are two of the best players. You know, I I think if you had pulled anybody in the league, they'd be in the top 10, anybody, I, I, I believe. And, you know, there's all that talk where Austin Matthews was a better player than Connor McDavid and stuff. So I think a lot of that fuels that and the, just the media attention and, you know, just everything surrounding that team. I think, you know, like I'm an old school kind of hockey guy. And, you know, you got kind of a new school guy in um, – Pardon me, sorry. They keep getting the same phone call there. I don't. What is it? You, really want? you owe somebody money, Dinger. I don't. Hang on one second. I got to text this guy so he doesn't call me again. Hang on. <laughs> you can still hear me though. Yeah, you're so good. I'm an, old, you're I, I'm an old school guy, and I just like that. You know, like like when Lou Lamorello was there, and I think you know, like he did such a good job, and then they kind of tossed him aside, and. Now they have Dubas in there. Sorry, one second. Uh, and now you have Dubas in there. And then there's nothing wrong, but he's that new school. <clears throat> he's that new school mentality of analytics and all that stuff. I'm back on video. They're hating me right now. He's that new school. So Dubas is that new school guy where, you know, I'm going to use analytics. And Sheldon Keefe, who, who was actually my first roommate in in uh, Tampa there, and he was going to be his coach, and he had that kind of pre-decided. And, you know, the old, there's still a lot of old school hockey fans that, you know, believe in that. And like, you know, the analytics is great, but like the bottom line is you can play or you can't play and you can have the best stats in the regular season, but come playoff time, <clears throat> that's a whole different animal. I think we saw that last year at the lightning and you know what Steven Stamkos, people were chirping him in the playoffs and he was hurt and he wasn't really a leader and he wasn't playing and he should have been playing. And I'm, I was just like, you guys have no idea what this guy's going through. And if he could be out there, he would. And he did, he came out you know, injured himself, but scored a goal. And that was huge for the Lightning. And to, again, that's what sports are about. And, you know, you guys in Tampa there have a new school guy, Julian Breesbaugh, who, you know, I coached his kids for a few years. is a great guy and is a fantastic hockey mind. And what a good job he's done keeping that team together. Uh, I mean, just with the salary cap and, you know, when you win, winning's hard because everyone wants to get paid. And I think, you know, what you saw in Toronto with a lot of the dislike is Nylander held out and then he got money and then he came back and he wasn't that great. And then, it's just everything surrounding those guys. And you got a young guy, uh, Dino, who kept basically their top two players, their top like 20 million combined with Matthews and, and Marner to one goal. I mean, that's unbelievable. And then he's doing his press conference. He's eating a slice of pizza. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's straight out of uh, Maroon's alley, their big rigs alley. So I like that stuff like that is great. I mean, that's what sports are all about. So, I mean, it sucks for Toronto and uh, there's going to be some tough decisions and, but man, what a great story for uh, Montreal. Because even Carey Price, who, you know, guys are sports guys are prideful, and you know, even to this day, I still play. You know, I play hockey here and there. Uh, you know, the kids I'm coaching and stuff, and I've skated with some midgets, which is very difficult in my advanced age of 44. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I can still score a little bit. When I do, I chirp them, and I, I I hook and hold a little bit, and I bump them. But you're still competitive, and you have that competitiveness, and that's what I think what's lacking in Toronto and what Montreal found is that, you know, got a guy like Gallagher who's just a pain in the butt and man, he just, they wanted to win and they found a way to win. So that's what sports are about. And, you know, the lightning went through that a couple of years ago, trying, you know, they had to get up past Columbus and, you know, it was good for them. They did and they were able to win. So, you know, you have these hurdles and you have these tough times in your life or sports and, you know, either you can push through them and you can make a way through or you can't. And when you do, it's, Oh my God, it's so rewarding. And I think you've, you've seen that. We've seen that with the lightning and other teams and, you know, that's what's so exciting about the, the playoffs because you can take the regular season and you can be a 40, 50 goal scorer and just throw that right out the window because it doesn't matter because the playoffs are a whole different animal. And nobody's getting paid for the playoffs, right? You're all playing all those games for free? Yeah, but I mean, if you make $10 million during the regular season, I think if you have a good investment guy, you should be able to make it through the <laughs> spring and summer. So, But you do get playoff bonuses. But yeah, that's – I mean, you're playing for – not pride, but you're, I mean, now you're playing for pride. You're playing to win. I mean, that's what, I mean, the regular season for me, and I, I wasn't the best player, but you know, tides, it's kind of boring. Like you're in December, January, the dog days or whatever you want to call it, the middle of the season there. And, I mean, it's been different with the last couple of years of COVID, but 
<clears throat> I mean, it, you, I just couldn't wait for the playoffs because I love the finality of it. I love that, you know, that if I was put out there, my job in this, you know, wasn't to score, but if I did, oh my God, like what a bonus, but just to get the puck out and be relied on that or get it in or make a big hit or a fight or whatever, have a big shift that would inspire other guys. I mean, I just loved it. I, it was, you know, guys relish that, and, you know, Marty St. Louis in the past and then Stammer and Cooch and, you know, Victor Hedman and Vasilevsky, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have skated against him in the summer and he's the one to do shootouts and I'm not very good at shootouts anyways. And he's very good at shootouts. So I just remember him saying, Hey, grandpa, grandpa, you want to do shootout? And I was like, yeah, sure, man. <laughs> and it was like, it wasn't even like, he could have put one of his, like he could have put his catching hand behind his back and he still would have stopped me probably 99% of the time. So Anyways, uh, it was, uh, he's a competitor too, though, and you can see that. So, I mean, that's what you like, and, you know, Maroon's a guy too, like a, a veteran guy that they brought in and like, you know, when winning in teams and, you know, you got to bring, you have your star players, but then there's those, those other guys, those role players. And, you know, you've seen it, uh, the last couple of years, there's other guys, it's Bogosian, you know, I, I love it that, uh, you know, in the playoffs, there's two guys that played for the, three guys that played for the Atlanta Thrashers that were still, playing so Coburn and Bogosian they both played for the Atlanta Thrashers which I actually played against the Thrashers so that's how long they've been in the league for so it's crazy so you need those guys though you need those role players and Chen and you know I would see them compliment your your star player so I mean that's what that's the beauty of for me that's the beauty of pro sports but the beauty of hockey is it you know you can have a guy who's not a star guy or a big name guy that can really step up and uh, make a difference so uh, the reason why we got you on this week, I mean, we could have you on for a plethora of reasons, but of course you spent some time with Carolina. You spent some time with the lightning, won a cup with them. Uh, I didn't realize that you only spent 30 games with Carolina. What was that experience like? And when you reflect on that dinger, what comes to mind about the time they spent with the Carolina hurricanes, the 30 games before you. <clears throat> um, it was living in the same building as Jeff O'Neill and trip Tracy, the uh, color guy. And, we used to have a little fun when we'd have a day off. So I remember we, uh, there was always music pumping. And I was like, man, Trip, we got a game tomorrow or something. And you know, he liked to have a little fun back in the day. And uh, Jeff O'Neill's, uh, I don't know if you ever see him on TSN, but he's very, what's the point? He's very dry and very sarcastic. And so we'd have fun and whatever. And uh, Bates Pataglia was another guy. So we always, you know, if we had a day off, we'd go to Bates' place and play some ping pong and, or beer pong or whatever you may call it. But, um, you know, my time in Carolina, like, again, the music was pumping and I wanted to live downtown. I'm like, where's this music? I'm like, Trip, what the heck, man? Why are you, like, what are you doing last night? He goes, it wasn't me. So come to realize there was actually uh, the parking lot we shared was with a, uh, with a gay bar. And we're like, okay, so we got to go in. So we went in, oh, Jeff O'Neill, myself and his girlfriend at the time, and who uh, I believe is his wife and my wife, girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now. And, trip and a couple of us went into the bar and it was it was great so we just you know what are the odds in Raleigh North Carolina so that's in um you know I remember like it's great the fans now and they they do the post game whatever it's called they what do they call it the roll oh, the pro, uh yeah what what's it? the little thing they do out of yeah yeah know. or they cheer and clap and do the bowling ball stuff or the, yeah yeah all that stuff but um <clears throat> I like I just remember there was a game one time and you know, they weren't that the Carolina, they weren't, the Hurricanes weren't really that big. They hadn't gone on their run. And I remember going to, it was like a Sunday afternoon game. And there's literally like, I don't know, 5,000 people. And then we go up for warm up. And they hadn't even started the music. So it's still like the elevator music, really quiet. You know, it's like, do I go up for warm up. It's like so dead. I'm like, turn the freaking music up. And I just like, so it was a Sunday afternoon game. There was like 10,000 people in the building. And I was like, oh my God, this is just painful. So that's kind of what my memories of uh, Carolina was. Like I went there and I got hurt in training camp and, you know, things didn't work out. Maybe the way I'd hoped, I'd hope to play a little bit more. And um, yeah, I ended up getting traded to Tampa, which worked out great, except I was on the road. So when I got traded to Tampa, I only had one suit, a couple pairs of underwear and a couple dress shirts. So I had to go to the mall and Razor, thank goodness for him, and uh, did my laundry for me. So I didn't... Uh, didn't have to wear uh, dirty underwear too many times or turn them inside out to get the clean side. But anyways, <laughs> that's the story. That's the story for a whole different time. But yeah, Carolina, I just remembered that. Just hanging out with Bates and, uh, and uh, Jeff O'Neill and Trip and just uh, like great guys on the, like Rod Brindamore too, like him and Ron Francis. So like, I'll tell you, here's another one. So Dude, Brindamore Herbie, looks like, Brindamore looks intense, like 24 seven, like even off the oh ice. My God. Oh my God. So he, 
<clears throat> I know this guy, Colin Forbes, who played in the league. And so he played it for Rod. They call him Rod the Bod. He played with him in uh, Philadelphia. And, like, he said, does Rod still talk to his parent? I go, what do you mean? And he does this thing where he goes, you know, like this. Like, you know, he's always doing this. We're like, okay. Like, I'm like, what is he doing? He's like, he's talking to his parents. So you do this thing where he kind of turned his head before the game and he was in a stall, like, getting ready for the game. And, like, he's just jacked. Like, he'd walk around with, like, shorts on, no shirt, just six-pack. And so, I remember, like, after games, I would work out because, you know, I would play my six or eight minutes. And I remember I'm in the uh, – so, I'm in the weight room. <clears throat> and Rod, you know, Rod Brandenburg played, you know, at the time, I think he was 30 – he was over 30 or cult, whatever, right? And I'm in my mid-20s. And, and like, I, so, I'm in the weight room. And I'm on the squat rack. And he comes in. So, I do a set. And I rest for, you know, like a minute or whatever. And then – so I go to do another set and I watch him. He's kind of pacing around the weight room. And he's like, I find, I'm like, okay, he's waiting for the squat rack. I'm like, okay. So then like he's pacing around. I'm like, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to make up weight because I just saw so him doing squats. I must have done like 50. And it wasn't like super heavy weight. It was like, whatever. I played on each side of But I'm going to make up weight. And he was so angry. Like he just, you know, he wanted to get on the squat rack. And I'm just like, my legs are buckling. But I'm like, I'm going to make him weight. And he's, just look at real like, why well, he just wanted to get on that squat rack. And then, you know, as soon as I racked it, he's like, Hey, I dare you on with a squat rack. Can I get on there? I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. I guess. So whatever. But I just like, he, he was so intense, a great guy, great guy, but just super intense. So you had him and you had Ron Francis. Then we picked up Tom Barrasso and Man. Tom Barrasso was awesome. Like I joke around with him, call him Carlton. Cause he wore the sweater vest and like, he had these, like, he was a stylish guy, let's say, and he spent a lot of money on his clothes and in practice. So Tommy B, if there was a pass across and there was a, a guy, if there was a guy on his off wing, like Stammer, for example, or Cooch, if they're on their off wing, they can take it one time and he'd literally step out of the net. And like, just right out of the net, like, just like clear, like over to the face off guy. And I go find Tommy, like, what are you, Tommy, what are you doing, man? He goes, I'm not taking one high in practice. Sure that, man. <laughs> and I was like, Okay. So he literally just he'd peel right out of the net. And then so then we had this young guy. So you know, we could bet and they were they were telling stories about being in Pittsburgh. And so Tommy was suspended uh for two games. And he's like, he said he said to the coach, Yeah, I'll see you in three days. He went to Lake Tahoe for the weekend. And then like, what do you mean? He's like, I'm not getting paid, I'm not here. So they had they had uh Frank Peter Angelo was their third goalie. It was him, Ken Reggett, and then Frank Peter Angelo was like the practice goalie and like the good team guy who got the beers because whenever Tommy didn't want to practice. He had to jump in, so just stuff like that. So anyway, so they had this young guy, Eric Cole, and Cole's he was a you know good kid, and you know he's a rookie, and he'd go and he'd shoot on Tommy B, and he just like flip it at him, like just a little, like basically like a pass. I go, Colsey man, like you shoot the puck. He's like, what do you mean? I said, well, like you shoot the puck, but just you know keep it low. Like you know, I practiced against Patrick Waugh, and like there's no way I was hitting Patty Waugh up. I saw everything was below the knees. And, if I can do it and I'm not a skilled player, then you should be able to. So Coles is like, okay. I said, shoot the score, but just, you know, keep it low. The next time he comes down, he just rips a laser and just drills him like right in the clavicle. And Tommy goes down. He's like, so then he's done for practice. And Paul Maurice is like, burr, burr, yeah, burr. so he's got to just practice because you're down to one goalie. And oh, God, it was great. So they had him and Arders Urbe, who was awesome too. So he'd sew his own, whenever Archie wasn't playing, he'd sew his equipment on the bench. Because he had been the guy, and then Tommy came in and was playing a little bit more of him, which was a little unfortunate because our, our reserve he was such a Archie was such a good guy. And when I was hurt and stuff, he would come out before practice. He'd be like, yeah, dish, you know, I'll come out. I go, what do you mean? He's like, I'll come out. I'm like, you don't have to come. Like, I'm skating before practice because I'm injured. And he would come out, and he's like, well, it's no fun skating by yourself. So he'd come out and let me shoot on him. I'm like, so stuff like that. So, you know, they they ended up winning a cup and stuff. And a uh, great group of guys. But, yeah, there's just uh, – Man, There's a few what, memories right there. That's surprising. I thought you would have been like, I don't even, I, I thought you would have had like no memories of your time in Carolina because it seems so brief, but man, it seemed like you had a ton. So did you get, did you sign with the Lightning the next year? Did you get traded to them? What what happened? <clears throat> no, I got traded. So, you know, we'd won the cup in Colorado and then <clears throat> I got traded to Carolina and, you know, what kind of talk was that I was going to maybe, I was going to play on the third line and then I got hurt in training camp, pulled my groin. And long story short, just wasn't playing that much. So. Uh, I just looked at it. It was an opportunity there. I just had a great run in the playoffs. So I got traded to Tampa towards the end of the deadline. And that's when, you know, I first met my buddy, Andre Walk, is me, him, Shane Willis. And God, there's a bunch of us were all in the hotel. It was great. We were having a good old time. And God, everybody was like, no, it was good. But it, like a ton of guys were hurt. Like Marty was hurt and Freddie Modine and Tim Taylor. And 
I don't know if I told you a story before, but like we were literally like got to a point where we were calling guys up from the East Coast, like literally because they didn't want to take more guys from the American Hockey League. So you know, I got traded uh, during the season. So it was uh, it was interesting, but it was you know Paul Maurice was a good guy. Like he just you know I just wanted to play more, and it, I looked at it where you know I just like, again I'd come off like I thought some of the best hockey I played. And I was playing like nine ten minutes in the finals and wanted an opportunity. So uh, my buddy Jay Feaster, who was in Hershey. Uh, who's in Tampa at the time uh, traded for me. So Jay traded for me twice. He put me on, he only put me on waivers once. So we're still on good terms. <laughs> <laughs> I love Chris, Jay. Jay's awesome. I, I, I love Feaster. All right. Now, I guess this is what somebody told me. I feel like I've talked to you so many times, you know, you have so many stories, but apparently you owe me a drummer story from the last time that we talked there was somebody that tweeted us or Facebooked us and said that you had a story. I don't know, drumming with Aerosmith, ACDC. I don't know what it was, but I guess we didn't get to the story because we didn't have time. Do you recall what this man was talking about? Uh, it was probably the Garth Brooks story where... Uh, yes, that's what it was. So Garth Brooks has this charity called Teammates for Kids. And um, so every year, like, so he's retired at the time and he was only doing charity stuff. So... <clears throat> you have this weekend where you'd have one weekend for the baseball guys and one weekend for the football and hockey guys. And what he would do is he'd, if the, the head of the foundation was Scott Zebedus and Zeb's a great guy. And so what they, if they, there was a guy that could play guitar or sing or whatever, excuse me, they call him up on stage and it was great because it was all the guys and they invite, uh, you know, it was in Vegas. So they invite some high rollers and they, would auction off all these items like a Garth Brooks signed guitar, his hat, and all this stuff. It raised like ridiculous amounts of money, right? So <clears throat> I've been going for years, and we were having we had a good group uh, from Denver we'd won with, and we kind of did some fun things over the years, like wore referee jerseys and hockey helmets and different things. And <clears throat> so Sean Burke, who was a teammate of mine in, in Tampa, there, Burke's a really good guitar player, so he'd gotten up and played. And so, like, anyways, I guess they caught wind that uh, Zebs had caught wind and told Garth that I played drums. So it's like, it's a weekend and usually the night before they have a concert, but they have like a, they have a live auction and a dinner and stuff. So Steve Levy and Barry Melrose would host the live auction and dinner. And then when they, Garth would do a concert, he'd either, and he kind of rotated every other year. So one year he'd be by himself and he'd just do acoustic and it was awesome. He'd tell stories about, you know, I wrote this song for George Strait or I did this or that. And then every, the next year he'd have the whole band. So. Anyway, so we're at the, uh, you have a, like a pool party or a suite, which was like a house, um, <laughs> whatever hotel we're at. <laughs> so this year, we we're, so we're at the Venetian, we're at different hotels. This year, we're at Caesar's Palace. And so we're down by the pool. And uh, so I feel these arms come around me. Like, I turn around, it's Garth Brooks. And he goes, Digger, is that you? And I'm like, oh, my God, yeah, it's Garth Brooks. And hey, and he's like, oh, I hear you play drums. And I said, yeah. And he's, he's like, you want to get up and play tomorrow? I was like sure man absolutely <laughs> if you want it's up to you love to and he goes okay come down to sound check tomorrow we'll see if you can you know play i'm like all right did you think it was so a joke a pretty... or did you think it was a joke or you thought no no he was legit? oh yeah no no he was legit because the year before there was a guy there was a football player who got up and was saying he sang like much too young to feel this damn old and he was unbelievable but he froze after like two bars so garth was playing guitar and the guy was singing and then he stopped and he's trying to help him and so I'm like, this is going through my mind, not at the present time, because I had a few. And so anyway, so I go out and I gamble and have a good night, stayed up pretty late. Uh, so I go down to sound check and I'd lost my phone. I left my phone. I got it. I lost it the week before I left in a cab or I don't know, something. So I got no cell phone. So I go down to uh, sound check and it's at the Coliseum at Caesars. You know, it's like the Wayne's world or, you know, like that thing where I go, okay, hey, Chris Dingman, whatever. You know, the guy's like, oh, sorry, you're not on the list. I'm like, no, I'm part of the foundation, please. Like, the guy's like, no, sorry, you're not on the list. I'm please. like, come on, man. Like, please. Like, I'm supposed to hear for sound check. He's like, sorry, man, you're on the list. I'm like, listen, like, I play hockey, whatever. I just want to cop. Like, and he's like, sorry, man. I'm like, come on. Like, you're killing me. So I go, Caesar's Pass. I go back to the lobby. I go up 37 flights to my room. I get on the phone. I called Scott Zebedew, the head of the foundation. And so I call Zabs, he answers. I'm like, Zabs, man, I'm like, I'm supposed to be sound check right now. And I'm like, I'm out on the list. He's like, oh, okay, don't worry about it. Just go back down. I'll take care of it. I'm like, okay. So I go back down, 37, 37 floors, go back to the lobby. <clears throat> Literally, exact same guy. Hey, Chris Dingman. Oh, sure, no problem. Go on in. And I'm like, you're such a dick. <laughs> like, just, he's doing his job, whatever, but uh, whatever, right? 
So I go in and like they're done sound check. And like, so Garb's standing around with the band. I walk in like just total party a-hole, right? And like, I'm like, oh, hey guys, sorry. It was a place like Fort Knox and wouldn't let me in. Like, I'm really sorry, Garb's like, oh, don't worry about it. So he looks at his place, so you like, funny for me i guess maybe not for them but he was really cool about it they knew like security was so tight for him because he was retired and he wasn't doing he would only do stuff for charity like everything he did for like the 10 years or whatever where he was raising his kids um where you know he went and lived on that his farm in oklahoma or whatever it was like he only did stuff for charity so it was like like they, they you weren't allowed to film anything like i have film of it i have a dvd but you can't burn it or anything so i actually have a dvd of me playing with him but anyways so, you know, he's you know, there with the band. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, looks at the band. He goes, you guys don't mind if we play a couple more songs, do you? Like, what are they going to say? No. Like, so yeah. get on stage. He's like, oh, you know, go, we'll all go up on stage. And he's like, oh, so can you really, you know, can you really play the drums? I was like, yeah. So I start playing, you know, just like whatever. He's like, okay. So we play the jam a little bit. And he goes, do you know that song that summer? I was like, yeah, absolutely. He goes, take it from the top. And I never played it in my life. I can listen to music and I can play it. Like I'm not really good at reading music, but uh, I can listen to music and I can I can play it. So and it's not an easy like not an easy song, but drum wise, it's not like playing Gojira or Metallica or Slayer or anything like that. So they're like I, I play it and yeah, pretty much perfectly. Like the average person wouldn't notice the difference. And then he's like, "Oh, I want to do the ending a little differently. Can you take it from the third to last bar?" I was like, "Oh my god, seriously? <laughs> like, okay." <laughs> so. I'm so hungover, right? Like, I think I still had a buzz from the night before, but I'm like, okay, sure, yeah. So he do it, and he's like, okay, so you really want to get up and play tonight? And I was like, yeah, sure, man. Like, you know, yeah, I'd love to. He didn't tell me when I was coming up or not. Like, he didn't say anything. So I got to sit through this. Not, not that I have to sit through this, but, you know, we're down by the pool, hanging out. And then, so we go to the live auction and and uh, charity dinner and stuff. And, um, you know, having a few beverages, my wife's like, don't drink too much. Don't drink too much because there's a, you know, I can – have a few and or maybe more than a few and still be able to play and but there's obviously there's a there's a limit where you can't play and you know it's still trying to have fun so i'm trying to enjoy myself i'm at caesar's palace and i'm at the table i'm literally like in the front table and i'm like hey i'm caesar every time i'm getting my table to bid on stuff like 75 and i'm like go higher man and like 90 like whatever and like this is 90 grand or 100 grand on his hat and guitar and so anyways and then it goes, I got to, I got to make it through dinner. And then, so after dinner, we go from one of the convention halls to the Coliseum at Caesars. And so I'm like having a few, but I'm like pacing myself, whatever. And then we go into, you know, the Coliseum and then he starts playing. I have no idea what I'm playing. Like he didn't tell me anything. So, you know, I'm like, I'm just like, okay, just get one beer. I'm like, okay. 30 <laughs> minutes later, 40 minutes later, I'm like, I got to get another beer, man. I'm just like crapping my pants here. And I must've went to the bathroom like 50. I wasn't, like, it wasn't even fun. Like, I'm so nervous. Like, yeah. I'm going to play, you know, at any bar or whatever. This is Garth Brooks, man. Like, this guy's a legend. And if I mess this up, like, I'll just never hear the end of it because there's all the hockey guys there. And I just get verbally abused for years. Were you convinced <clears> it was <throat> still going to – at this point, were you still convinced it was going to happen? Oh, yeah. Like, he said he – like, I because he did, he, he's, he'd done it every other year with a guy okay. or, or two. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, I just – you got to be ready. So, like he's playing like friends in little places and all his hits. And I'm just like, like this in my ears. Like, That's all right. like, I'm not even enjoying the concert. So finally it was like 45 minutes into the show or something. He's like, Oh yeah. You know, like I'm down by the pool last night. And, you know, I don't know if you guys know Dinger, but if you give Dinger a couple, couple beers, he thinks he can do anything. So I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a way I can embarrass him. So he's like, I know how I'm going to get him up, come up and play. And he's like, drummers, they're different people. They're animals. And he's really good. at like the whole presentation of storytelling and, so he's going on and on. He's like, oh, I tried playing baseball. It's not like playing right field. You know, drummers, you got to have a little talent. So you have a little fun at his own expense. And he's like, Digger, are you still out there? Are you checking out? And so I was probably 25 rows back or 30 rows. So I get up and got to walk through the crowd, like straight through, like, oh, oh my God, man. I thought you'd yeah, be like, like backstage ready to go. You know, he just looks at oh, you. Oh, no, no. Come... Oh, no, just hanging out. There. I was hanging out in the crowd. So. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but it was great because, you know, I walk up and I go through, like, Brian Inkbaum was there and obviously Mel Rose and Levy and <clears throat> all these famous hockey players. I don't want to list off because there's probably a hundred of them. But so I walk up and, <clears throat> you know, the drummer hands me the drumsticks and he's like, he looks at me, he goes, oh, can you really play the drums? So we kind of, we did this, we agreed, we do this, like, just a jam, like a bluesy rock jam where everyone would do a solo or whatever. So we just do it, you know, playing and 
keyboardist, you know, the organist and the guitarist, everyone's doing a solo. I did a little drum solo. And so we finished it. And then, uh, everyone's like, Oh wow, this guy can actually play. And then after everyone stopped cheering, whatever, he goes, that's pretty good, but can you play a Garth Brooks song? And he turns back and then launches into, went to work, you know, I went to work for like summer, you know, whatever. I'm not going to sing it because I'm not a good singer. <clears throat> that's why I'm a drummer. <clears throat> I'm not like Phil Collins. So I am, I'm strictly good at drumming. <laughs> And I could play Under Sandman and Stairway to Heaven on the guitar, and that's it. So, anyways, uh, Dude, so we play that song. It sounds like you nailed it, though, in front of Garth. Yeah, yeah so, we, yeah, I did it. For, I almost screwed up. I tried to do, like, a little uh, a little fill when I shouldn't have, and I started, like, just to get it going. The guy, I just said to the guys in the band, I'm like, just give me a look if I'm going too fast or if there's a, a change or something. Just give me a look or a nod. So I started to, like, do a little – on the snare, I started to do a fill, and then the guy turned and looked at me, and I was like, okay, and I quieted back down. And, so thank God. So I didn't, so I played it like pretty much, you know, to the average person wouldn't really notice the difference. So I played it pretty much perfectly and, you know, do the ending, dun, 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 boom, whatever, finish. And I'm like, oh, I got it. the drummer. I, can't, you, I you know, get off the drum kit, go over to him, like give him, give him a high five. And he's like, oh, that's awesome, man. And then, so I go over to Garf, I go to shake his hand. And he, I don't know, he gives me this big hug. And I whispered into his ear. I was like, wow, was that an awesome <laughs> and I was like, was, that was my like whatever, like oh my god, like, I almost like almost kissed his ear. So I was like, that was awesome, man. Thanks so much. Like it was just like unbelievable, you know. So I won two, you know, at that point I won two cups, and my wife was pregnant with uh, our second child. And I was like, oh my god, if I die tonight, it's like I've had a great life. Like my insurance, my life insurance is paid up. My my kids will be taken care of. I was like. That was awesome. I was walking off stage. He's like, I want to wait till he gets a little bit further. But <laughs> so he cheered me, made one more joke. But it was great. He was so good. It's uh, just the storytelling and uh, just getting people involved and guys. And it was awesome. Like, oh, yeah. Man, that still brilliant. gives me goosebumps a little bit. Yeah, I can't believe I did it. So, yeah, I was, uh, but I was more nervous for that than I was for like any playoff game or game seven. Yeah. I if can that see makes that. sense. I could see that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah well, because in hockey, I got my buddies to bail me out. I mean, if I mess up for Garth Brooks, man, oh, geez, you know, that guy's a legend. Dinger, it seemed like throughout the course of that story, you they asked you like 12 times, like right as you were about to drum, like if you could really drum. Like, I think they really, really <laughs> want, I mean, everybody was drilling you about that. Like if Garth, if you told Garth you could, why is his drummer then jamming you up as you're about to get behind the set? No, he, he wasn't jamming me up. He was like, you know, he, uh, like he was, like he, sorry, I, maybe I told this story incorrectly. Like Garf on, in the in the in the microphone said, "Oh, can you really play? You know, can you really play?" Oh, okay. Kind okay. of thing. Yeah, it wasn't the drummer. Yeah, yeah. But okay. you know, the thing is, you know, we'd already played in sound check, so like Garf knew I could keep a beat or whatever. But you know, like you hear guys could play, but you're you know you want to have fun, but it's Garf Brooks too, so he doesn't mess around. Like so, you can come up and play with him, but as long as you don't totally butcher the song, you know what I mean? Because he's still like I don't know, prideful, but he's a talented guy, so. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, he, he wanted to make sure he had sound check. He knew I could play, but uh, I was still really nervous. <laughs> Man, that's a hell, that is a hell of a story. And I definitely w think I would have heard that before if you told that. So there, that was our to be continued on that, the Garth Brooks story. Uh, I want to know, last time I, I checked in with you, you have, you were building a, a rink in your backyard. I, is that still there? I don't know what the weather's like in Edmonton now. Tell me how that situation's <laughs> going for you. Well, it's uh, although we are in Canada, uh, it isn't quite Arctic weather, so the rink's been gone for a couple months. But um, I have a I have a, I have a grade in my backyard, so the one end I I literally built the ice up about two feet, probably give or take, and I had a couple leaks. And I had a neighbor call, French Canadian guy actually called the city. I mean, these guys came out. They're like, hey, what's going on? I heard there's a leak or something. I'm like, oh my god, I don't know if it's me or not. They were really cool. I gave him some gloves, some steel gloves. And oh, good, good. Gift card. Yeah, I gave him a gift card and stuff. And then the guy came over, and it was funny because like, I said, I'm so sorry, man. I've never made a rink before. I just moved back from Tampa. And the guy, the, the, the guys from the city, go, what's your name? I said, Chris. I go, what's your last name? I said, Dingman. They go, I know you. You used to play for Tampa. And I said, yeah, whatever. They're like, oh, okay. And they're like. So then my neighbor who had called the city on the camera was like, oh, my God, you know, what's going on? It's ice everywhere, blah, blah, blah. He goes, hey, do you know who this guy is? Leave him alone. He's just making a rink for his kids because, you know, everything, all the rinks were shut down. So, you know, like there was nowhere else to do, you know, like uh, my kids couldn't skate. So, yeah, I was building the rink. So I had a couple uh, mishaps or a couple leaks I figured out, but I had really good ice. Like when I got it, 
when I got it down, I had really, really good ice. And then, so the guy was like, he, so he was so sour. He said to me, like, oh, because I had another, like, tiny leak or something. And then, you know, I have some friends that are on the police force. And I was like, listen, this guy's all over me. Like, and then the peace officer came out. He's like, he inspected the rink. I said, I don't know if it's me or not, but I'm like, I'm just building a rink. Like, I don't think anything's leaking. He's like, I don't know. I said, what's the fine? He goes, 250 I said, I'll pay the fine right now. I'm building the rink. Like, my, I'm building my kids a rink, so I don't care about this guy. And the guy was like, no, he was really cool because, you know, with COVID, it's, you know, there's a lot of people at home and unhappy and stuff. And I said, listen, you probably don't want to even be out here. Like, like you got better things to do. He's like, yeah, you just have people that are home and unhappy or whatever. He's like, oh, this is fine. I have no problem with this. So, yeah, it was a, it was a bit of a trial getting it built. But uh, so when it was starting to melt, like, what I did is I took a hacksaw and I started cutting off pieces of the ice and I'd bring it to the front of my house because my neighbor's like, I put in these pavers, these I paid fifteen thousand dollars for these pavers oh, Lord. in my backyard, in my on my driveway, and I'm like, why would you spend that in Edmonton, Alberta, where it's like freezing cold? And like, if, if you're ever in Edmonton, like the roads are, you know, not very good. Like any country song where you're talking about, you know, riding on the back the backwood roads or whatever. Yeah, that's what roads are in Edmonton are like. So when it gets really cold and it gets hot, what do you think happens to the pavement? You know, tracks and it's bumpy. So don't ever own a sport car here with the low profile tires so i was like what kind of idiot makes him like who does that like who like why would you get brick pavers like uh, that backs up to an alley or whatever like the corner like yeah, that's around. his problem that's not your problem yeah he's just being a dick whatever so like the guy was super cool my buddy's a cop he's like listen tell him to go you know what he's like tell him to give me a call because i was like really can this he's like oh if i have to I'll see if you my driveway's ruined i'm gonna i'm gonna sue you i'm like sue me for what oh my god like building a rig like this is canada like what's wrong with you? like this is canada man you build rigs you like odrs they call them outdoor rigs so anyways i broke up the ice and i bring it to the front so just so he couldn't i looking because i'm like that i'm like i'm not going to give this guy anything so i would break the rig down a little like every weekend i just like or every couple of days i'd break it down and bring the ice to the front so there was like no water in the back at all. So he couldn't say where. And it's just like, that was my big middle finger to Man. the guy who was just being crusty. I was like, you got nothing better to do. He's like, and he said, oh, I know you're doing this for your kids, but I don't care. Because like, oh, oh. his problem was when people would drive through and splash, the water would splash. I'm like, well, it's not my fault. People are ripping through the alley. Like, so anyways, yeah. Finger, was, uh, in, so, in all seriousness, like that's an incredible thing that you did for your kids so they could have that. And I know a lot of people were doing that during quarantine in Canada. How many times though have you told your kids through over like the last year? We're like, I built you a rink back in the backyard. Like, how come you don't appreciate that? Have you had to throw that up in their faces at all? And if not, you should, because that's a big deal. No, no, I uh I chirp them about plenty of other things, like when I beat them in basketball and and other things. So I gotta <laughs> my wife's like my kids chirp me now it's bad like it's not bad but i kind of deserve it i'm like why well, you know it's like they're just chirping me all the time she's like what do you expect you chirp them all the time like what do you think was gonna happen so i never chirped them about the rank because it was something i wanted to do and they loved it and it was great so it was a, I, I i did it once and i had really good ice too so i made like a little mini zamboni i watched a couple of youtube videos and made a little Zamboni out of PVC pipe and a cooler and stuff. Like I was into it. Like I wanted really good ice. So every night I'd shovel it and I'd, I'd Zamboni it. And I took pride in that. If you're going to do it, you do it right. So, cause it was one time older kid. was like, what's wrong with the ice? Why is it so bumpy? What'd you do? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like I would wait, they go to bed and I get out there and then like late at night, like on the weekends, like it's hard to do when you got the baby and the kids. So you got to sneak out. Like when they go to bed or they're, you know, they're watching a movie with mom. I'm like, okay, I'm going to build the rink. She's like, okay, just, and then you got to get out there and you got water for a little bit and then you got to wait and then you got water. And then I did the lights and all that stuff. So it was cool. Like, it was like, you know, I remember my dad did it for me when I was a kid and you know, there's things you do for your kids that I didn't trip. No, not at all. I just, I loved it. I, I, I even put on the goalie pads one time for my 14 year old. And I was like, listen, you can shoot on me, but no slap shots. Like just, and he's like, he lit me up. He's like, you can't stop anything. You're brutal. I'm like, <laughs> Oh my God. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I am. <laughs> I'm kind of brutal <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, you know what? You got to lock those kids out of the house, Dinger, and teach them a lesson one night. Let them uh, sleep on the streets or in the backyard on the uh, rink. Oh yeah. No, 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 we didn't do that. We, uh, so I taught them, uh, you ever seen, you ever seen the movie cable guy? Yeah. Obviously oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, uh, I'm on Steven's team. What are we playing? Prison rules? And, like, so we puts in the mouth guard and he's just chopping guys. So we play basketball and 
it's prison rules. So I get chopped and like, so my older boy, he hard fouled me. And like, so I go up for, uh, well, we weren't playing like the full, like the full height of the net. Like it wasn't 10 foot. It was like eight and a half or something. So I go up for a dunk and he pushes me. Oh my God. Like I'm like, whew, I go flying and I almost hit the tree and I dodge the tree and I do a tuck and roll. And like, I'm laying on the ground. And I'm like, Oh my God, just hurt. Like, Pride's hurt and like my body hurts a little bit. And then my other son comes and jumps on me. He's like, What's wrong? You wuss or something? What's wrong? I'm like, give me please get off me. Just give me a second. I'm in pain right now. And then I'd explain to him, like, listen, like, okay, you can chop me, you can hack me, but like when a guy goes up, you don't push him from behind. Like, you know, it's like NBA or whatever. And like, why? What's the problem? You know, well, I wasn't gonna let you have a free one. I was like, Yeah, you're right. But I'm like, if you want dad to be able to walk. Or play basketball with you ever again? You can't do that because I'm like, I almost hit the freaking tree. And he's like, well, yeah, but you didn't. I'm like, yeah, but I don't. And like, okay, I created a monster here. Yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> a little yeah, bit, so. Yeah, he's he's going to be you. So, yeah, just just stay healthy as long as you can. Who knew you'd have to stay healthy during your playing career and during your parenting career now? It's like, uh, it's even more difficult <laughs> to stay healthy, you know, post-playing. Cool. So, listen, Dinger, I appreciate it, man. Incredible stories, as always. Stoutgloves.com. Stoutgloves.com. If you need the gloves, Dinger has them. Hit them up. Ding Dish. Uh, Twitter uh instagram you're on tiktok killing it on tiktok i just got on tiktok myself i followed you gone through all the videos i love it you've been on tiktok for a while making great things back i think when quarantine started last season is there anything you want to say to the uh to trudeau do you want to be freed from edmonton do you need to come to america and come to a lightning game is there anything anything you want to say to the people do you need do you need help being smuggled across the border well, I got my first vaccination, so I don't know if I'm considered essential, but if anybody wants to set up a meeting with me in Tampa, uh, I'm more than willing to come down and I can come to a game and we can talk about business, uh, gloves or whatever other business you do. And uh, as long as it doesn't cost me too much where my wife will get mad, uh, no problem at all. Yeah, you can, uh, I'll be there. I'm, I'm undefeated in game sevens. I can be there for the team. I, you know, I could just uh, cheer, be, with, be there with you. I could just follow you around. We, you know, that's, well, they, they barely give me tickets but that's listen if anybody wants dinger in tampa for business or conversation or anything he's available get this man out of edmonton he's been there for two years <laughs> trudeau's trying to keep him there forever but we need a dinger back in america stoutgloves.com chris dingman one of my favorite people to talk to thanks so much man great catching up great stories Venner, very entertaining and i uh, will do this again soon yeah no problem buddy anytime go bolts <laughs>